today we have a math expert. She is a teacher and she has a tutoring service. She's going to let you know all about how to make sure that your kids are prepared for upper level math and how they can improve their proficiency in mathematics. Hi, thank you so much for joining the Falling for Learning podcast. We have this podcast to help parents and caregivers with having the resources, strategies, and tools needed to make sure that their children are on track for learning and to stay on track for success. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, so I've been following um, Alexis, Alexis and the Elevated Numbers. She always has really good strategies and tips for parents, and she obviously loves math. So let's start with talking about like what makes math, you know, did you like math always as a child or like what's your journey? What made you uh, like this subject so much? Uh, so when it comes to my relationship with math, um, math for the most part came pretty easy to me, but also it was a subject that even if, even when it didn't come easy, I was able to, um, work hard at it and improve. Um, and so reading was my challenge. Um, uh, when I was in elementary school, although I was pulled out for gifted in third grade, um, I ended up in reading intervention in fifth grade. Um, and from that experience moving forward, I just didn't really like reading. Um, and I think that's what made me gravitate more into math because I felt like I was better at it. Um, and I love that you can get the right answer. Like there is a right answer when it came to reading and writing. Um, it's so subjective that yeah. it was hard for me to uh, get satisfaction out of it when you, um, versus math where it was like, okay, at least I know I'm right or I'm wrong and I know I could work towards it. So that's, that's really what, um, gravitated me towards math. Okay. All right. And so tell us about like your educational journey, um, like where you went to high school, college and all of that. Awesome. Yes. Uh, so I'm from Long Island, New York. Uh, so I went to my local high school and, um, you know, when I was, when I was in high school, I know the, the major thing I remember from my mom is telling me that I was going to college. Uh, she didn't know how or what or anything, but she would just always tell me like, you know, you're going to college, you're going to college. Um, and I know right. one, yeah. <laughs> um, and I really appreciated that. Um, she went to, um, college for some years, uh, community college. And, you know, it's actually a funny story. Um, she was, she took me to her college class and she had a math exam and the teacher let me take the exam, um, the same time as them. And she was like one point away from passing. Um, and I was able to help her out. Uh, don't tell nobody. Uh, <laughs> um, but back to my high school story. So yeah, um, I just remember I went on a college tour in high school. Um, I believe it was the Alphas that was hosting it. Um, and from that time, I knew college was like a reality for me. Um, I went on an HBCU tour and okay. I ended up at Howard. Um, the best decision I made for myself as a young person, it definitely shaped me into who I am today. And um, yeah, going from Howard, I was able to have like internships and um, participate in case studies and things like that. And, and that really shaped me into the person I am today and in and, and the way that I serve, you know, my community today is um, definitely grounded in my experience at Howard. Okay. So what can you, can you tell us about um, what caused you 
uh, like what major did you have and why did you choose that major? Yeah, so I went to school as an undecided major. And, you know, I don't know if that's very common or not, uh, but I had no clue, not a clue of what I wanted to do. Um, Part of me wanted to be a teacher. And I just remember people saying that teachers didn't make any money. And so even though my natural instinct was, I want to be a teacher, I knew I couldn't decide on that because they didn't make any money. Um, And so after my freshman year, I ended up um, transferring to the School of Business uh, where I got a scholarship and I became an accounting major. So still math related. Yes. Um, And it it was um i'm like it's it's funny today that i ended up in business um i ended up becoming a math teacher through teach for america okay and now circling back many years later i run a tutoring company so it's mixing my business uh with my teaching career yeah and bring to one yeah and can you tell us a little bit like taking it back a little bit, you were telling us about taking the math course, like taking that math exam. How old were you when you did that? I was in middle school. I was maybe sixth grade. <laughs> okay. The professor was very surprised that I was able to do the math at that time. And so, um, you know, I brought it up to the professor and uh, he gave me feedback telling me that I did it that I did it right. And so when my mom needed that help, I was like, I know it's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so yeah. what kind of math did you take in high school? Like what was, what were the math courses that you took? Um, I was your traditional student. So I, um, back when I was in school, they called it math A and math B. Okay. Um, and I took pre-calculus and yeah, I didn't, I, I don't, I am not like your math genius, but I'm really good at teaching. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's like my unique gift is like, I'm able to help kids who, um, they haven't been getting it from year to year to year. And I help them break through those gaps and and really start understanding and retaining knowledge and okay. even go on to pursue math um, after me. But I'm not the one who who does those high, higher level math classes um, just because when I was a kid, it just it wasn't the path I was on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I like to work with students in middle school so that they have the opportunity to to go on whatever path they want to go. Um, you know, maybe they want to try engineering and, you know, having a certain level of math before college really can set them up for success. And so I like to catch kids in middle school because they do have big goals. And right. if they are avoiding a subject, if they are, you know, feeling already defeated, then by the time they have the opportunity to pursue that, they realize like, oh, I need math. <laughs> yeah. So tell tell us a little bit about what you've been hearing or what you know, what people say about math that maybe causes them not to like it. What can you tell the parents so they could look out for these things and avoid them? Um, well, it's very common for... Um, people in general to say, I'm not a math person. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just so common and it, you don't hear it as much um, as, excuse me, with reading, um, excuse me, to say, I'm not a reader. Mm-hmm. People don't want to say that out loud too much, um, yes. even though it's true and, and, but they don't want to say it out loud. But when it comes to math, like, Uh, a lot of parents will kind of make their child feel better about it. 
um, because they were they feel like they weren't good at math either. Um, but the truth is that you know everyone's different, right? And, and uh, math trauma is passed um, from person to person, whether it's from your teacher. You know, maybe you in elementary school, teachers teach multiple subjects and maybe they felt like, you know, math wasn't their thing. And they low key every now and again make comments about math. Um, yeah. Can you tell us like a little bit more about what math drama, trauma, math trauma is? Tell us about that. Yeah, um, I'm I'm a middle school math teacher, so I can't speak. um from firsthand experience about, you know, the, how that can impact kids. But what I do know is I feel like I couldn't teach reading or science. Um, I wouldn't want to do it. And so I know there are people out there who feel like they don't want to teach math. And I could only imagine what that feels like to have to teach multiple subjects um, that you're not confident about with 30 kids, mm -hmm. um, with all of their, um, you know, emotions and, you know, just being in the classroom. I can only imagine what it would feel like for an elementary um, teacher, um, but I'm sure it happens. Um, I spoke with other elementary educators who've even admitted to me um, that they, they also felt um, similar about teaching mathematics. Um, but yeah, when it comes to in the home, we we do use math every day. Mm -hmm. And um, some signs that parents can look out for is, is if your child feels a lot of pressure that they have to reach for their calculator mm -hmm. instead of taking the time to think. Um, I, I feel like that's a trauma response. Um, okay. There is like this pressure of like, you know, drilling for math facts, um, that speed is the, the goal. Mm -hmm. And since I don't have the speed, then I need to, um, make up for that. Um, and there's a lot of pressure with that. Um, but yeah, so I would say, like, if you notice your teenager, you ask them um, small things, you know, two times one. Yeah. They they know what two times one is. They do. I don't, I don't care. They do know. But if you see them reaching for that calculator, that's like a sign that, you know, there's, there's some extra pressure that they feel. And um, we definitely want to help them. Um, feel okay with you know taking risk and yeah. and and things of that nature. Okay, we're gonna pause for a break. Seventy five percent of children don't know how to write well. Add that to the fact that so many people out there are trying to silence the voices of those who have been oppressed and trying to prevent them from telling their story. Who's going to tell your story? If your child doesn't know how to write well, I have two books to address this issue, The Rewrite Method and The Rewrite Method Workbook, written to make sure that parents know what to do, that educators know what to do to get their children to write better and just not write better, but love to write. Make sure that your next generation could tell their story and they won't be silenced. Go to fallingforlearning.com today to purchase your set. Okay, so thank you so far. We've got so many uh, valuable tips and information from Alexis Guy. Please like and subscribe. And we're going to get into more details about how we can help our kids in math. Okay, so Alexis, uh, tell us about your methods that you use that really help kids uh, start turning around this negative, you know, math experiences. Absolutely. Um, so we, what, what we like to do in our tutoring program is really start with um, establishing a vision for their life. 
Um, Mm -hmm. So with our rapid math results um, framework, we first we start with students establishing their vision and success habits. You know, kids in in school right now, they're not being asked enough, like what they want to do, what they see for their future. And it's important because like I mentioned earlier, you know, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to go down these different pathways, there mm-hmm. are different um, requirements, there are different habits, there are different skill sets that you want to have in order to set yourself up for success in the long run. Right. And so we start there with them establishing their vision and really thinking about how they want to show up in the world. Um, Then we help them establish success habits. And so that looks like um, studying, right? Learning how to study, uh, um, checking over their work, speaking up, asking for help. Um, All of these things are habits that we um, develop together that they that they value that they that they see value in mm-hmm. um, and then we help them over 12 weeks um, meet those goals that they set out for themselves um, the next thing we do is we diagnose track and improve their um, math skills right and so there are some foundational math skills that you really want your child to master before mm-hmm. they head off into high school. Um, a lot of kids right now are scared of fractions. They immediately turn them into decimals. Um, and when I think about when I was a kid, that was something that I did, even though I felt like I was good at math. It wasn't until I started teaching math that I realized uh, the power in fractions and how much easier actually a problem can be for me to solve it in my head Mm -hmm. Um, when I keep things in fractions. Um, so these are skills that we don't want them to just brush over and rely on that calculator to do. Um, and yeah, so we diagnose, track and improve, um, whatever areas they need the most support in. Um, and then, uh, we primarily focus on exam prep. So, we help students who are um, heading off into high school and have to take high school um, okay. placement exams, um, like the HS, um, HSAT or the SSAT, the ISEE, um, or the SHSAT, <laughs> a little tongue twisted, but these are all exams that uh, students need to get into the high school of their choice. But the thing about these exams are they are timed and they Mm. don't get a calculator. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So they need to, they need to have mastered um, these foundational skills. The test is not hard because you really need to solve the problem in like under a minute. Mm -hmm. And so it's not hard, but you need strategy. You need um, a a strong foundation. And so um, we help them model exam success through um, mock exams and tracking their progress on their timing and things like that. So that's, that's our uh, rapid math results framework. All right. So can you tell us like for parents, like what are some things that parents might be doing that are causing their child to have a problem in their mathematics learning journey? Um, A big thing is not accepting where they are. There are Mm -hmm. learning gaps that they developed over the years. By the time a a student is in middle school, in eighth grade, there are a lot of things that could have happened. And, you know, shaming your child for not knowing how to do it is Mm. not going to be helpful. Okay. Instead, you know, you want to give them that extra time to think. You want to 
ask them in another way um, and help them see that the importance of um, understanding this stuff, right? So turning it into money, um, asking them like, okay, if I was paying you for this and even, even literally paying them for letting them do the math for their paycheck, right? For their allowance, for their, mm, okay. they do things for you because they might short themselves. And that's a lesson that they need to learn. So I would just say like the biggest thing for that parents want to be mindful of is how they address the gaps that they see. Okay. Because it didn't happen overnight, and so it's not going to change overnight. And so be gentle, get them the, the support that they need. Um, but yeah, just be gentle so that they can they can actually grow. Okay. All right. And so another thing that I was thinking about when you were talking is about um, maybe some missteps that you made as a teacher over the years that you had to change as you were learning how to be, you know, master mathematics teaching that subject. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was there was a lot, especially in the beginning when I was going based off of the way I was taught math. Uh, so there's, like I said, I was quick to turn things into decimals and do the math the long way. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't understand proportions. I didn't understand, um, you know, number lines and things of that nature. And um, cross multiplying and dividing. I know all of us know about cross multiplying and dividing, but that's actually not uh, the most efficient way for kids to learn that skill. Because, like I mentioned earlier, these exams that are timed you, mm-hmm. without a calculator you're making this huge number then to divide it um we know long division is a whole nother thing so there was just like little little math um ways of teaching math that i just didn't know and i did graduate school at Relay Graduate School of Education, and they did an excellent job of teaching mathematics. And so I definitely appreciate what I learned there and was able to bring back to my classroom. And yeah, I would say some other things would be timing, you know, um, not like having the right balance with time things in the classroom. Okay. Because we can be unrealistic. Like I just said, this test is timed um, without a calculator. And so as much as you want to have grace for them to take their time to think, we also have to be preparing them as well for what's at stake. Um, So yeah, those are some things that come to mind. Okay. And um, so where can, you know, what's the name of your company and where can people find you? My company's name is Elevated Numbers. You can find us on uh, Instagram at Elevated Numbers, or you can find us on Facebook uh, under my name, Alexis Guy. And yeah, we have a private Facebook group for um for families who are looking for math support as they're preparing for these um, high school placement exams. Mm-hmm. And we have tons of resources in there. And so um, definitely check us out on Facebook. That's that's like the main place where we live. And we look forward to showing up more on YouTube. So definitely follow our YouTube as well. All right, all of that is in the show notes. And uh, as you're thinking about, you know, mathematics, uh, one thing that we hear a lot from parents is that there's like a new way of doing math and they don't understand, you know. uh, So can you break that down a little bit? Why people feel like, oh, this is totally different math um, in opposition to the way they were taught when they were younger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I... 
I hate that Common Core got a bad rep. And I think it's due to how it showed up in elementary school. Uh, But from my experience in middle school, I appreciate the way that math is. So the thing about Common Core, the thing about the new math is that students, ideally students shouldn't feel like they're learning anything new from year to year. Every year is just a new layer to what they already know. And so that's the beauty of the new math, like um, something that might be familiar to um, parents is the area model. Have you heard of the area model? Am I getting too mathy? No, tell us what it is. You're here. You're our expert. Break it down for us. Okay, I'm not getting too mathy for you guys, but the area model is something that is um, visual and it can be reused from year to year to year. Like even in ninth grade teaching polynomials, we, we are still using the area model to help kids visualize what is happening. So as much as it might be different for you as a parent, uh, please embrace it embrace it and find resources out there to support you in understanding it so you can help your child but you don't want to create a narrative for them that the way that they're learning is problematic yeah it's just you didn't learn it that way and you and what the way you learned it isn't wrong either it's just they are going to learn the standard algorithm, which is the way that we were taught. Right. They learn that after they learn the conceptual. And yeah, we just have to embrace it and make sure we're not creating any extra um, noise for the kids who are learning it at the time. So if you have any questions about middle school math, I'm your person. Um, But if you have questions about elementary, I can still support and point you in the right direction because I know at at the elementary level, that's when parents are most involved. That's when they really, you know, are sitting with their child to do their homework. And so I can only imagine how frustrating it is, Um, but just know it is going to be helpful for them in the long run. And I just want to highlight what you're saying you're saying now they more more focus on conceptual learning when it comes to math rather than the algorithm. Can you break that down a little bit for the listeners to, so they'll understand like conceptual versus algorithm? Yes. So so let's take addition. Um, addition, you know, we carry the one, right? Mm-hmm. When when you're adding and in in elementary school they learn a a few different methods and for one it helps them reason so i've seen some people who are not able to estimate because Mm -hmm. they're just so carried away with okay i carried one if they don't have paper and pencil they're not going to get nowhere near the answer (laughs) okay (laughs) um but with these uh other with these common core methods or new math methods they should be able to visualize what is happening um when they're adding right so right 100 plus 60 like they're able to break it apart mm-hmm. and put it back together in their mind versus oh i carried one sometimes it's hard to visualize that in your mind um as much as breaking it apart is right um okay also it really emphasizes the place value chart. The place value chart is essential in students understanding uh, just the value of each place of value, right? So the ones, the tens, the hundreds. Yeah. And so, yeah, that that right there. I, again, I'm a middle school math teacher, but it, it it really comes down to, like I said, my students right now on one section of their exam, they get 30 minutes to do 52 questions, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> so well, they need to estimate in their head. They need to know that, you know, 10% of 60 plus four is like, you know, they have to do these things in their head. Yeah. And having that. Can you hear me? Yes. Ooh, something happened. Okay. I don't know what that is. Okay. Something happened. I couldn't hear you. The last part. Okay. So okay, yeah. I, just, I don't know if you want me to repeat it, but yes, just, please do. Okay. So having, having the conceptual understanding supports students and having that level of speed and automaticity to, okay. you know, then show up on these upper level, um, exams and so you know we don't want to brush past it we got to embrace it yeah well thank you so much for joining us today uh please check out alexa's guy and elevated numbers all the links are in the show notes uh, we really appreciate you um thank you thank you thanks for having me thanks again for supporting the falling for learning podcast New episodes go live every Saturday at 5 p.m. You can watch us on youtube.com at Falling for Learning or listen on all major podcast platforms such as Apple, Google, Audible, Spotify, and much more. For more resources, visit fallinginlovewithlearning.com. We really appreciate you. Have a wonderful week.